revitalizing move. Equities rally as Chinese authorities have stock trade tax and unveil several new measures to boost market trading and restore investor confidence. We discuss the details and the longer-term impact on the bourses. Boosting ties, Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao and U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo confer in Beijing. The meeting is seen as collaborative efforts to alleviate the strain between the world's two largest economies. Protests intensify in Japan and around the world days after Fukushima begins the release of nuclear contaminated water into the Pacific. From CGTN headquarters here in Beijing, this is Global Business. I'm Michelle Vandenberg. We start with the news about China's capital markets. The Ministry of Finance has cut the stamp duty on stock trading in half, effective today. The decision aims to revitalize the capital market and enhance investor confidence. In parallel, the China Securities Regulatory Commission also introduced several measures to reinforce market confidence. The Commission has announced that China will moderate the pace of initial public offerings and further regulate reductions in major shareholder stakes. Meanwhile, the government entity has also reduced the margin financing prerequisites for investors purchasing securities, lowering it to 80 percent from the previous 100 percent. This adjustment will come into effect after the market closes on September 8th. The reduction in stamp duty had an instant positive impact on China's stock market at the start of the week. Timothy Pope has more from Shanghai. The uh, slew of policies released today to support the markets uh, led to an early surge for Chinese A shares with the Shanghai Composite uh, opening around 3,200 points. But a lot of those gains did taper off throughout the rest of the session and the benchmark index closed back below uh, 3,100. Uh, it did still gain 1.1% and the Shenzhen component rose 1%. But sentiment uh, does still seem to be a little shaky. Uh, the markets were responding to these as policies to support stock buying uh, rather than the uh, broader economy. Uh, brokerage stocks certainly got a lift from the moves uh, today. Unsurprisingly, uh, changes to things like margin trading and stamp duty will make uh, the markets more attractive and therefore boost brokerage business. Bortai Junan Securities uh, added about 6.8% and Citic Securities gained 1.5%. Real estate developers also got a boost today. There were some new guidelines published for uh, planning and construction of more affordable housing in China. Uh, China Vanka stock uh, ended the day 4.5% higher, while poly developments gained 2.7%. Earlier, we talked to Chen Jiahe, Chief Investment Officer of Novum RK Technologies, about the long-term impact of the stamp duty reduction. If we look at the long, longer term, then the cutting of stamp tax will uh, return more profit for investors. In 2022, the overall stamp tax collected from the stock market was almost 300 billion RMB. So this cutting returns around 150 billion RMB for the market. And besides the stamp tax, there is also the very important policy given out by the CSRC uh, that is aimed at regulating the stock selling of dominant shareholders. Uh, the new rule said if a company is having problems with its profitability, uh, stock price or dividend policy, then the stock selling of its dominant shareholders will be limited. Uh, this largely increased the responsibility that dominant shareholders will take to the companies. And it is a very useful improvement, especially when we look at the long term. Moving on to the performance of Chinese industrial firms. China's industrial firms experienced a 6.7 percent decline in profits for July on a yearly basis, extending the downward trend for a seventh consecutive month. However, there was a positive note as the decline showed improvement compared to the previous month, with the rate of decrease narrowing by 1.6 percentage points. During the first seven months of the year, earnings contracted by 15.5 percent year-on-year, following a 16.8 percent drop in the first half of the year, with this reduction also exhibiting a slight improvement. While numerous companies saw diminished demand throughout the year, a notable ex exception was seen in equipment manufacturing, which posted a 1.7 percent growth from January to July, diverging from the downward trajectory that most the industrial firms experienced. In particular, sectors like electrical machinery, rail and ship manufacturing, and equipment and instrument making reported profit growth. 
data released by the National Bureau of Statistics revealed the decline in China's industrial profits narrowed for the fifth consecutive month in July thanks to the enhanced corporate profitability and a recovery in industrial production. The data also points to the robustness of the country's supply and industrial chains, which provide comprehensive services such as raw material delivered to component manufacturing, distribution, assembly, processing and logistics, culminating in the ultimate delivery to end consumers. Our Zhang Shixuan spoke to an industrial supply chain service provider to delve into the extensive intricacies of these networks. Industrial manufacturing can involve millions of small components and tools, linked closely with one another and all indispensable to the production line. So sustaining those supply chains is a big and vital task. This company in Shanghai now supplies some 7 million kinds of critical parts and tours, and is now offering digital services to make them all easier to manage. Since last year, the firm has seen a notable increase in demand for its products and services. Since 2022, due to changes in the global environment, companies have had to improve themselves. And the most direct way is to enhance their supply chain, involving purchasing, logistics and storage management. And they've been seeking digital solutions. Every day, we receive an increasing number of inquiries from small and medium-sized firms. Restricted by their small scale, they are usually weaker in dealing with risks. So they need higher quality supply chain management, which can help them optimize costs more. The company will be one of the 2,600 exhibitors at the China International Industry Fair this year. The exhibition, which will open in Shanghai next month, will see a racket high number of exhibitors and in the size of its exhibition area. New trends like low carbon and intelligent industries will be the highlights. Companies involved in the whole industrial chain will be attending. The fair not only has robot developers from home and abroad, it also features some key component suppliers. We have extended the exhibition content to the entire chain, so as to enhance the core capability of the industrial chain, as many companies are facing transformations and require core parts. They're also in urgent need of digital transformation to enhance efficiency. It's the first time since 2020 that Shanghai will be hosting the fair, and more than 500 new products or services are expected to debut. The world's top four robot firms and hundreds of small and medium-sized enterprises will showcase their products and services, building further networks between industrial manufacturers and those they supply and which supply them. Zhang Shixuan, ICS for CTN, Shanghai. You're watching Global Business, still to come. Chinese Commerce Minister Wang Wentao and U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo confer in Beijing. The meeting is seen as collaborative efforts to alleviate the strain between the world's two leading economies. The world economy as we know it is about to change. Global business reports highlight emerging markets, developing countries, and dynamic sectors worldwide. We feature top analysts and newsmakers to provide perspectives on every facet of business. From an on-the-ground perspective, we provide you with balanced and objective assessments. Fast, sharp, and insightful. Global Business. Only on CGTN. Chinese Minister of Commerce Wang Wentao and visiting U.S. Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo have met in Beijing. The meeting is regarded as mutual efforts to ease tensions between the world's two largest economies. Raimondo arrived in Beijing on Sunday for a four-day visit to China. The U.S. said this visit is to boost bilateral business ties. Our reporter Zheng Chunying has more in Beijing. 
Gina Raimondo arrived in Beijing late on Sunday for a four-day visit. Uh, the U.S. Commerce Department earlier said that the goal of the visit is to, uh, quote-unquote, to hold constructive discussions on issues relating to the U.S.-China commercial relationship uh, and challenges faced by U.S. businesses in areas for potential cooperation. Well, in the past three months, she's the fourth high-level U.S. officials to visit China, uh, you know, after Secretary of State Antony Blinken, Treasury Secretary Jenny Yellen, and Climate Envoy John Kerry, who all left China without any concrete or uh, tangible results. However, according to some experts that I've spoken to, they believe that Raimondo's visit this time may have a better chance. Because let's not forget that just ahead of Raimondo's trip, the U.S. Commerce Department has lifted restrictions on 27 Chinese firms by taking them off a list that prevented them from buying from American suppliers, which is seen by many as a goodwill gesture. Uh, especially given the fact that Biden signed an executive order just weeks ago that restricts American investments in advanced Chinese technology, such as artificial intelligence, semiconductors, and quantum computing. So the expectation is that Raimondo really wants to drive home the Biden administration's message that a recent curse by the U.S. on American investment in Chinese companies is narrowly focused, and that Raimondo, uh, according to media reports, wants to boost travel and tourism between the two countries as well and also hopes to help Boeing company uh, to resume shaping its 737 MAX jets to China for the very first time since 2019. So just as what she said about the trip, um, the U.S. side wants to have a stable commercial relationship and the core to that is to uh, maintain regular communication. So it's widely believed that her visit will continue the messaging that both sides are willing to talk and seek more common grounds. Despite the intricate and multifaceted economic ties between China and the U.S., trade activity has experienced a recent decline. During the first seven months of this year, bilateral trade stood at 2.6 trillion yuan, or 366 billion U.S. dollars, down close to 10 percent on a yearly basis. This constitutes more than 11 percent of China's overall foreign trade and positions the U.S. as China's third largest trading partner following ASEAN and the EU. China's exports of goods to the U.S. witnessed a 13 percent year-on-year drop during the first seven months of this year. Tensions between the two nations have escalated partly due to the U.S. imposition of export restrictions on specific microchips to China. In response, China imposed limitations on two rare elements crucial for advanced manufacturing. Further intensifying matters, U.S. President Joe Biden issued an executive order preventing U.S. companies from investing in select Chinese firms, citing concerns about national security. This encompasses businesses engaged in military-related technologies like artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Despite these strains, the allure of the Chinese market persists for American corporations. Prominent U.S. leaders, including Elon Musk from Tesla, Tim Cook from Apple, and J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon have visited China in recent months. Earlier this year, Dimon even participated in a Chinese-focused, China-focused conference held in Shanghai. Earlier, our reporter Zheng Chunying sat down with Michael Hart, president of the American Chamber of Commerce in China. He shared with us why the China market remains crucial to the U.S. amid tensions between the two countries. Amid the potential prospect of so-called uh, decoupling from China, there are also concerns um, that the multinationals are moving their supply chain out of China. Uh, what do you make of China's role in the overall global supply chain? So I think it's natural for companies and countries to make sure they have a diverse uh, and well-balanced supply chain. So over the decades, China has built itself up as a major manufacturing uh, and sourcing location. China will continue to be an important part of U.S. companies and European company supply chains for decades to come. China has always been stressing its interest in FDI uh, and its commitment, its strong commitment uh, in further opening up. From your point of view, uh, what are some of the opportunities could that create for U.S. companies? We do believe China will continue to be an important place for U.S. companies to invest. So there are plenty of areas where China is uh, a leading sector. So for example, electronic vehicles. Um, China's consumer market is very attractive. Uh, aviation sector is very attractive. So a number of uh, our member companies are very interested to continue to engage with China to see what China can do from a consumer point of view, 
but also China will continue to be important in terms of manufacturing and supply chain. So a whole host of our companies are very um, interested in continuing to doing to business here. And we need to manage the relationship. So U.S. companies have said over the past three years their number one pain point was U.S.-China relations. So if we can make U.S.-China relations better, we can probably expect more FDI from U.S. companies. Earlier we spoke to Professor Liu Baocheng from the University of International Business and Economics. He told us there are good signs for U.S.-China trade. There are very few other countries that can really replace the two biggest economies in terms of interdependence and complementarity in trade and investment and the technological cooperation. However, uh, we do notice that uh, since the Trump administration, there has been escalation of trade wars. However, we can uh, see that uh, the U.S. is really changing its tone uh, given uh, the uh, interdependence. And so, as you mentioned, there are uh, a number of high-level uh, you know, administrators who come to China to pave the way uh, in order to set the uh, guardrails against the possible veering into conflict from competition. So uh, this is really a good sign. And uh, right now, the recent decline uh, in China-U.S. trade uh, cannot really be completely contributed to the decoupling efforts uh, over uh, the uh, uh, over the Pacific because of the uh, economic performance and also because of the weakening demand in the United States, etc. Both of the markets between China and the United States need some sort of adjustment. And uh, I still uh, think that uh, the China's position is not really uh, easily to be substituted despite of the decoupling or de-risking efforts from those politicians because it is really the business people and consumers who make the final decision in who they want to trade. You're watching Global Business, still to come. Protests intensify in Japan and around the world days after the former started releasing treated radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear power plant into the Pacific Ocean. We are all connected across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Tokyo's decision to release nuclear contaminated water from the wrecked Fukushima power plant has triggered protests both in Japan and abroad. Terence Terashima reports in Tokyo. Since the release of uh, contaminated wastewater into the Pacific Ocean, which uh, began last Thursday, there have been several protests across various uh, parts of Japan. Demonstrators reiterated their concerns, saying that the water discharge will cause significant damage to the environment and global food security. The organizers say they will continue to protest until the government stops the wastewater discharge. According to a Mainichi newspaper survey over the weekend, 60% of respondents expressed dissatisfaction with the government and Tokyo Electric Power Company's explanation regarding the release. This marks seven point increase from the previous survey in July. Tokyo Electric Company has said that they conducted tests on seawater around the Cripple plant, revealing that uh, seawater samples contain less than 10 becquerel of tritium per litre. However, these uh, reports have not allayed many concerns. In response uh, to the discharge, China imposed a complete import ban on all aquatic products from Japan immediately. According to the market research firm Teikoku Data Bank, over 700 Japanese food exporters are affected. Sales of aquatic products to China and Hong Kong accounted for 42% of all Japanese aquatic exports in 2022. Meanwhile, experts from South Korea arrived in Japan on Sunday and visited the field office of the International Atomic Energy Agency, which was opened at the plant last month to monitor the safe discharge of the treated radioactive water into the Pacific Ocean. Length of their stay this time has not been determined yet, 
This marks the first of the series of bi-weekly visits by a South Korean experts to the agency's field office at the plant. CGTN, Tokyo. Fish markets and sushi restaurants in China are distancing themselves from Japanese seafood imports after Beijing announced a blanket ban from the country following the release of radioactive wastewater from the Fukushima nuclear plant. Huang Fei reports. Feng Changhao and her husband have been selling seafood at the Huangshan market for over 20 years. All of their catch comes from the coastal waters of Guangdong province. It will be months before Fukushima's wastewater is estimated to reach Chinese shores. Some international experts have said the environmental impact is negligible. But Feng is still worried about the future of her trade. We buy from fishing boats, so we know them well. Many of them have fished for generations. The ocean is their livelihood. How will they survive if the ocean is polluted? They can't just switch careers. What will they even do? This is the largest wholesale market for fresh seafood and aquatic products in China. Scallops were among a small fraction of goods imported from Japan. On the day the import ban kicked in, market operators conducted a surge and told vendors not to drive up prices amid fears of a supply disruption. Just days into the South China Sea fishing season, the Huangshan market offers plenty of fresh catch in the region. The shops are, as you can see, as busy as ever. In fact, a lot of people tell us they're here to stock up on seafood before they become too dangerous to consume. Uh, I'd be too scared to eat seafood in the future. We'll have to wait for a few years to see if the fish will mutate. I'm here to feast myself and my children before it's too late. Across Guangzhou, Japanese restaurants are not waiting. This sushi chain says it's long invested in international sourcing, especially from Norway and the Americas. The chain's brand manager, who only wished to speak in the voice recording, said it has replaced Japanese ingredients on the entire menu. Once Japan announced their plan in March, we had already stopped importing from the country. By August, none of our outlets used Japanese ingredients. That includes aquatic products, meat and even sauces. Sourcing globally does push up costs, but the company promised it will do its best not to pass them on to customers. The import ban appears to have sparked an interest in domestic farms. Shares of several aquatic farms surged following the announcement on Thursday. But with the conveyor belt of Fukushima's discharge already in motion, some sashimi lovers are resigned to the idea that their food may never be the same. Even if you avoid radiation from seafood, you can't avoid it from everything else. Eventually, the entire world will be affected, but we still got to eat. Huang Fei, CGTN, Guangzhou. The impact from the Maui wildfires isn't just confined to the disaster zones. The entire island is struggling without the huge influx of summer tourists who help to keep Maui's economy going. That's especially true for hotels and resorts. Greg Navarro explains. Yeah, are you, are you at the unit right now? Business at the Maui Sunset Resort Hotel is down. We're at about 50% uh, of where we were a year ago. Way down, because part of the 50% currently staying here are first responders and emergency workers. What you won't find here and at other hotels and resorts on the island are many tourists. Normally at this time of the year, Maui would see about 7,000 visitors coming to the island every day. At the moment, just 2,000 people are coming here daily. Word of the deadly Lahaina fire and the unbelievable images coming out of the historic town spread rapidly around the world. We started seeing cancellations within two days and it, it dropped dramatically. Some hotels and resorts quickly became part of a federally funded effort to secure hundreds of rooms for victims displaced by fire. So far there's been, I would say, more than $10 million that's been distributed in the uh, two weeks since this terrible, terrible disaster. Um, and that money primarily, at least half of it, has gone to lodging costs. But that program is designed to be temporary. For hotels, it can't compensate for the hundreds of thousands of tourists who would normally be filling beaches and rooms. The hotel that's strictly relying on tourists, they're taking major hits, and I've already heard of layoffs happening 
and bit a large number of layoffs. All of this comes after many of Maui's resorts and tourism based businesses barely survived through the pandemic. What remains to be seen is how long visitors will stay away and how long it will take Maui to once again be viewed as a sought after tropical destination. All right, thank you. Maui Sunset General Manager Jason Carter says that depends on how well businesses get the message out. Maui is not shut down. Lahaina is. Be respectful. Don't go into Lahaina, but also for the rest of the island. Come visit and spend spend time. And Carter says spend money to help keep people employed and prevent the kind of hit to Maui's economy no one here can afford, especially right now. Greg Navarro, CGTN, Kihei. Chengdu in southwest China, Sichuan is best known for its world-famous cuisine, panda bears, and rich culture and history. In recent months, night markets have also become a key driver of the local economy. Zheng Songwu reports. As a new first-tier city, Chengdu is one of the most popular destinations in China, especially during the summer holidays. The tourism industry draws visitors by day, but night markets are also a major attraction. The Quanzai Alley, or the wide and the narrow alley, is one of the most popular pedestrian and cultural sites in Chengdu. And it attracts thousands of people every day. And we can still see there are so many people in this area. And the tourists here can learn about Chengdu's history and buy something they really like. The Quanzai Alley features wide and narrow alleys, as well as one alley featuring a popular well. With a history spanning more than three centuries, it stands as one of Chengdu's most distinctive landmarks. Tourists savor authentic local cuisine while enjoying traditional Sichuan opera. The tourism industry here has flourished during the summer vacation. Seven p.m. had the most visitors. About 80 customers occupied my 45 tables on the first and second floor, and the tables were still not enough for all the tourists. There were so many tourists from July until late August, as it was the summer holiday. The barbecued squid is the most popular food in my shop. Dandan noodles have sold well too. The two-week-long Chengdu Fisu World University Games, beginning in late July until August, also boosted the local economy. There were over 20 million tourists visiting the alley by the end of July, creating a revenue of 300 million yuan, which was double that of 2022. The number of tourists surpassed the whole of 2019. Global athletes preferred to visit here in the evening as the weather was too hot in the daytime and the shops in the alley were open until 2 a.m. during the Chengdu Fisu Games. Chengdu is planning to open more night markets over the coming months, as well as a range of cultural activities. As the summer holiday draws to a close in late August and the scorching temperatures grow cooler, the climate in the city is also likely to make it an attractive destination. Chen Song, CGTN, Chengdu, Sichuan Province. And that will do it for this edition of Global Business here on CGTN. I'm Chavannenberg in Beijing. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.